Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. Vice President M. Venkaya Naidu on Sunday said that the time has come to revisit the 10th schedule of the Constitution. The Vice President underlining the need to revisit the 10th schedule of the Constitution, also known as the anti-defection law, said we should discuss this and come to a conclusion. Legislatures are for debate, discussion without disruption. Further, Credibility, capability and capacity should be the yardstick for anyone to enter the legislature and not caste, cash and criminality. A comprehensive relook on the statute is required, is what he emphasized. The Vice President made his observation at the release of his book chronicling his two years in office by Union Home Minister Amit Shah. The 10th schedule of the Constitution is better known as the anti-defection law. Allegations of legislators defecting in violation of the law have been made in several states including Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Arunachal Pradesh, Goa, Manipur, Nagaland, Telangana and Uttarakhand in recent years. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyse the 10th schedule of the Constitution of India. Joining me on the programme today are J. Sai Deepak, Advocate of the Supreme Court, Shekhar Rayar, Senior Journalist and uh, Sushil Chandra Tripathi, former Principal Secretary, Uttar Pradesh. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Mr. Rayar, let me begin the program with you. So, what is the 10th schedule and what is the history of the anti-defection law? Why was there a need to bring in the anti-defection law? No, this was conceived during a period which was uh, infamous for uh, IR arms and Gaya arms. You know, we had uh, instable uh, governments, you had instable coalitions. And this was around the time in the mid-80s when Rajiv Gandhi was Prime Minister. The first of the anti-defection law came, which was uh, which insisted on one any split. There could be no individuals dissenting the party on a ticket which they were elected, and it had to be a minimum one third of people. And uh, that was in mid '85, and that too that was the time when you know Rajiv Gandhi had just got elected. He had a huge majority, but nevertheless, many of the state governments run by the Congress were facing a lot of instability because of dissensions. Now. Uh, somehow along after nearly, uh, I would say, till we came to uh, when NDA 1 was in power, you, the, it was felt that this provision of one third of members can only you know, form a group and split from the parent party was seen as inadequate to check this. After all, in between 1985 and uh, say 2003 when the NDA came with the uh, an improvement on the anti-defection law. In between, you had a minority government of Narasim Rao gaining majority over those five years. You know, taking splinter groups from Janata Dal, uh, the Janata Parivar, you know. And then you had the JMM and the infamous JMM bribery case, where, you know, in fact, uh, the bribe money was actually paid into the, I mean, were rather deposited in the bank accounts. That was a period when the minority government of Narasim Rao was gaining. Now, when the NDA came, up, and apart from that, law commission had gone to into it, so what was done? So finally, uh, what was arrived at during the NDA government and the amendment was brought was, uh, one was that at least for anybody to split away and go away. And in between, you remember during VP Singh uh, government's time and when Rabi Rai was speaker, the, there, there were definition about split, the definition about merger, they all underwent a lot of change because the interpretation was given that merger is a continuous process. That means uh, MPs can go on leaving to the other side, you know. So these were a lot of questions. So this provision was brought in that at least two thirds of them, of members of parliament in a particular party will have to, you know, actually merge with the another party in order to save their seat hmm. if they wanted to leave the party or the, uh, which from which they had contested. And along with that, it was codified, you know, you could lose your seat if you voluntarily gave up. And then the question was this proviso that, you know, two thirds will have to merge. And finally, the speaker's decision was made as absolute. It could not be questioned in any, therefore it was put in the, the schedule of the constitution so that it cannot be challenged to the court. Sure. Sure. But, so this is the how it happened. Now, this was and also a provision was brought in the, the constitution that the composition of the government could not be more than the 15% of the strength of the legislature, mm. which also to prevent as a disincentive to anybody from, uh, from the non-ruling party to join the ruling party in the hope of getting a ministerial birth. Right. Because right. there is a cap on the number of ministers. Sure. 
so this is all was done during that period now down the line now we have seen that uh, parties have found a way of mm. going mm. about this uh, uh, this uh, i would say the need to manufacture a mandate and uh, at the role of the presiding officers have come under a lot of scrutiny sure because we have seen instances as late as in karnataka you also mentioned about tamil nadu so where you know the presiding officers role you know whether they were trying to help the ruling party how about uh, uh, if not a split a challenge to them you know the, the numbers they command in the house right absolutely so, so these have thrown up lot of questions as sure. to what should be the guidelines what should how, because the whole idea is it should be free and fair right. to to the members of the legislature and parliament as well as to the parties right which have initially made them the mlas or mps right absolutely so we'll come we'll talk about what more needs to be done as far as the anti defection law is concerned but jsi deepak how have the various courts in the country looked at this law over the years so uh, considering the kind of uh, exclusive jurisdiction that these eight paragraphs of the 10th schedule have vested in the speaker as well as the house and have protected the proceedings with respect to disqualification as proceedings within the meaning of articles 122 and 212 to prevent them from being questioned before courts there is a significant amount of insulation that is inbuilt as part of the framework of the 10th schedule that's point number 1 be there as it may apart from the uh, i mean notwithstanding the express uh, barring of jurisdiction of courts which is there as part of the 10th schedule itself Uh, a bar on the jurisdiction of a court only means perhaps bar on the jurisdiction in terms of a formal uh, proceeding that can be initiated pursuant to a specific remedy being provided it still does not bar the jurisdiction of a court under 226 or 227 thanks to the fact that these have been interpreted as plenary powers which are part of the basic structure of the constitution coupled with uh, the judgment of the supreme court in chandra kumar where they have said that it would mean uh, going against the basic structure if there is any provision of any law that takes away the power of the court in its writ jurisdiction so that is precisely why notwithstanding the presence of a clause which bars the jurisdiction of the courts under 10th schedule you still have a good number of judgments where these matters have ultimately found their way to courts so one of the most popular judgments on this issue is kehoto holohan judgment where effectively the supreme court had laid down uh, the scheme of interplay between the judiciary's intervention as pa- as as far as these proceedings are concerned and the level of discretion and autonomy that is supposed to give to the speaker and the house so frankly speaking what the supreme court has only said is that we cannot force a certain decision you cannot weigh on the speaker with respect to a certain outcome and all you can do is you can wait for the outcome and then question whether the process has been followed because ultimately it's only a question of due process, process that the yeah. court can look into and assuming that uh, the the speaker decides to sit on that particular issue for a significant or an inordinate period of time then courts have tried to uh, set the ball rolling and expedite the particular process but even that has come under scrutiny because you never know what kind of political sensitivity is involved as far as that issue is concerned but i certainly believe that time has come where uh, there is at least some kind of a time frame that is incorporated as part of the 10th schedule with respect to the decision that is to be taken you can't keep sitting on it because then it ends up defeating the very purpose of the particular uh, uh, let's say the provision itself absolutely Second, so it has to be a time bound process correct so apart from that i think uh, while this is not just a question of the speaker the parliament or the political parties involved it is ultimately a question of betraying the trust of the people who have put you in power mm. so does it mean that you also give certain remedies to the electorate which would mean that if you believe that a certain elected representative has betrayed your mandate can you invoke a right of recall is that something that can be considered so i think there could be other issues as well because the one thing that you can perhaps put faith in that there will be at least a few public minded civic minded individuals among the electorate who are relatively uninfluenced by any strings that that may connect them to the political party so there must be at least a remedy that is given to the members of the public or the electorate to question the elected representative if he betrays their mandate this sure. i think is a part of the discussion right absolutely so mr tripathi that having been said talking about how lawmakers have found a way to circumvent the law or go through it in fact in several of the instances has the law now outlived its utility i think so you know 1985 law was a step 
power. 2004 law further improved it, but we have very ingenious people who are in politics, so they always find a way to go around it. And uh, this is what is happening. So I have, uh, you know, a, a few observations and comments in light of the present day situation. Number one, the 10 schedule says that defection and the spirit is that defection is bad, but merger is all right. So anything in retail is bad, but wholesale is all right. Secondly, the there is a fiction created mm. in a 10 schedule that if two third legislators of a legislature, they go and join another political party, then the original party goes away and they merge into a new party. Now, this is an anomaly because that party continues to have legis legislators in other legislatures and in other house of parliament, etc. So, the political party, like any association of individuals, whether it is registered society or a company, these decisions like merger, etc. are taken by the general body. Here a legal fiction has been created that only the legislators of that legislature, two-thirds, decide then it becomes merger. So my view is that the normal law should apply and this proviso should be dispensed with. In fact, I am a party to uh, uh, an NGO, we are thinking of filing a writ also in the Supreme Court, a PIL, to look at this provision hmm. so that the normal law in case of association of individuals and persons, which allows the general body to take decision rather than this legal fiction, when uh, two-third legislators, they go and join a party, so the whole party gets merged as far as the activities in that legislature is concerned. Other issue is that here, the speaker has been given all the powers. You see the article 102 which spells out disqualification for parliament and there is a parallel article for state legislatures. There, there is a role for election commission. The parties are in a way not very strictly but election commission is the regulator. So here also I feel the election commission as a non-partisan body should have a role because speakers are political person. They are obliged to the party in power because the party in power which has numerical majority in a way selects and elects the speaker. So that also need to be looked at. Lastly, hmm. the 10 schedule provides for rules and regulations to be made. Now, I don't think very specific rules have been made either in the parliament or in the legislatures because as has been mentioned, I am pre I have I was privy to what was happening in UP in 1997-98 when the speaker said that the defection, the split is continuing. So it went on for several months until it reached the threshold when uh, the defection would not apply. Hmm. So those things should not be there. There should be a time limit. There should be time limit for the split or, or the persons uh, going into another party to, uh, to merge as well as there should be a time limit for a speaker to de give decisions. Otherwise, I think bring in a non-partisan body like Election Commission, which has a role in respect of other disqualifications. Certainly. Right. So, Mr. Ayer, your thoughts on, uh, you know, should we amend the 10th schedule of the constitution? So definitely, there is a need to look at uh, the provisions and look at uh, what has happened since 2004, you know, and particularly the role of the presiding officers also because uh, there's a lot of criticism that has you know come particularly role of some officers and as to should the speaker have totally unfettered powers because what we have seen we saw in Karnataka you see mm -hmm. when they had gone to resign their resignation was not accepted and then subsequently when the ruling party then the ruling party was given time to to see that if they can be persuaded, when they could not be persuaded, then the disqualification started, which became a continuing process, like Tripathi ji was saying, which I said, even Rabi Rai, there is a, you know, that split is a continuing process, mm -hmm. he had given an order. So, we saw one, you know, MLAs being done in batches, when they are all resigned at the same time. So, therefore, the role of the presiding officers and the kind of powers they enjoy, of course, Supreme Court stated view is that, they would go only into the due process and not to the powers of the 
speaker. But then again, there were instances like uh, we saw in Uttarakhand or Arunachal Pradesh where Supreme Court mandated certain processes and procedures. So I think it's time to take a look at it. But also, I think a situation where if somebody who is got elected in a particular ticket and he wants to resign and contest afresh, see the. So should there not be a room for uh, dissent? Because that question also arises. There are so many things involved. Of course, there are instances of manufactured uh, mandate or manufactured uh, minority government becoming a majority government. We have seen even at the center during Narasimharao's time. So these are issues that a lot of things have been taught up. But then our own elected legislators will have to decide this issue. Our own elected members of parliament will have to decide this issue. Mm -hmm. That's why I often say that there are certain uh, things in our constitutional scheme of things which only drives home the point a pair of tongs can uh, catch almost anything but it cannot catch itself so that would require uh, i would say a honest retrospection and into as to and as well as introspection as to how are these laws functioning and whether they reflect the people's mandate whether they reflect the people's choices. And of course, there is a demand for uh, right to recall. I, I can recall um, the then uh, Lok Sabha speaker, Somna Chatterjee was also one of the persons who said that this is something uh, we should give our thought to. Absolutely. Right. So, uh, Sai, uh, what aspects of the 10th schedule need further scrutiny, do you think? I think one of the important things that merits uh, scrutiny would be the grounds of disqualification and defection under uh, para 2 because the second clause of this particular paragraph effectively says that if you abstain from voting or you vote against the official mandate that has been given to you by the whip of the party then that qualifies as uh, as a ground for disqualification and that would be treated as defection unless and until you have the prior consent when it comes to either abstention or for voting otherwise now, according to me, this level of a fetter on an ele elected representative is something that we have to think about. So, what are the things? Assume for a moment that the party is taking a position that is different from the position that it had actually promised to the electorate as part of its manifesto. And it is that particular representative who is actually in sync with what was promised and the party is going against what it had said before. Even then, if he chooses to abstain or if he chooses to uh, vote against the party, he would be seen as defecting or that would be a ground for disqualification. So there is a situation where the elected representative is consistent with the promise made by the party to the electorate, but the party is going against that. Then that qualifies as dissent and there is a problem there. Therefore, I think a revisitation of the concept of a whip and the amount of independence and autonomy that an independent or let's say uh, uh, an elected representative, albeit as member of a party, has is something that we need to consider. That's point number one. Point number two is we saw a situation before the elections that even the integrity of the election commission was questioned. Mm. So assume for a moment that the election commission were to be made the body to which this particular issue is ultimately relegated to. I think that would only politicize the election commission even further as a consequence of which whatever little benefit of doubt is given to the body at this point of time even that would be undermined. According to me this is intensely political and perhaps that is why the election commission must be kept away from it. It might help to actually consider the composition of a committee which has certainly the speaker as the chairman of the particular committee. But perhaps a retired member of the judiciary and one more person perhaps an odd numbered committee which presides over proceedings relating to disqualification on grounds of defection. So while you can question or you, you can, you can uh, ideate and think about how do you uh, deter defection. The first question would be to ask ourselves, is it important now to actually revisit what amounts to defection in the first place? And secondly, what level of autonomy should the speaker be given with respect to these kind of decisions? And is it possible to actually involve, let's say, other members, so to speak, and not necessarily members of the judiciary, former members of the judiciary, so that there is some kind of dissipation of powers when it comes to these kind of decisions, and there is some level of pressure that can be put on the speaker to expedite the proceedings in case the speaker does not expedite the proceedings. Right. Because if the speaker is uh, the judge and all unto himself as far as this particular issue is concerned and there is no initiative on his part to expedite the proceedings then there must be at least some kind of a leverage or a pressure that comes from other members of the particular committee. So I think these are certain aspects. Constitution of a separate tribunal altogether would mean to actually 
depart and deviate from the significant premise today that these are matters that must be exclusively within the house and that means sending the matters to the judiciary that would be a significant departure which i don't think is warranted at this point of time right so mr tripathi does the anti defection law at some level you know affect the ability of the legislators to make individual choices or individual decisions and how do we respect that absolutely if you look at the constitution and i try to see all the 395 articles political party does not appear anywhere political party was brought into constitution by the 10th schedule the constitution therefore it gives more importance to the rights of the people the voter and the rights of the representative but today the situation has become such that the political party determines everything so therefore the balance has to be restored and uh, the other issue i wish to make is if any major change is not contemplated at least the provision which says that the rules should be framed by the speaker and the chairman and the various legislator and legislative assemblies uh, chairpersons that must be i think enforced and to that extent even supreme court can say that it is reasonable to frame the rules not what the rules are that will be of course for the speaker in the house to look at but at least the rules should be framed so that arbit arbitrariness is not there in the individual cases all right closing comments now from all my guests starting first with you mr raya so what kind of changes do we need to see going forward as far as anti defections are concerned i think the first thing that we can, i mean which i see is easily doable is what the vice president and rajya sabha chairman vengaya ji and i do as said which is to have a time limit you know we, <clears throat> and uh, time limit for the presiding i mean for the uh, for the speakers to dispose of the uh, instances of anti defection uh, <clears throat> violations that is that's a very important time bound manner and uh, vengaya ji in the same breath has also said that uh, election petitions petitions challenging the election of a member that also take a long time in fact in his address in chennai uh, he specifically mentioned cases where uh, an uh, a person who was elected in 2009 and who was whose election was challenged those those cases are still, still pending, pending. Mm-hmm. and already have had one election in 14 and another in 19 so somewhere along the justice gets delayed of both the parties because when a when a petition is pending in the court you know there is an uncertainty as to the membership of that uh, concerned person at the same time the person who has challenged it feels that he probably lost an election um, in a manner which he thinks was not fair to him but he doesn't get immediate justice he has to wait for a long time that is perhaps i think would be doable perhaps there could be special courts similarly vengai ji has also suggested that there should be special courts you know or to speed up the cases of corruption or cases of criminal cases against of course one view the supreme court took was there the members of parliament could not be given precedence over the general uh, you know the members of the public who are facing similar charges of say crime or uh, uh, corruption so uh, therefore i think the need again again i think the problem is about the pendency of cases huge time lag and therefore uh, amount of uh, anguish in sense of you know getting a fair uh, justice from the system all right so uh, speedy delivery of these particular issues is is the best way forward or the best start at least to this particular problem is what you are suggesting this i deepak the best way forward i don't know what the solutions could be but certainly the areas which require attention according to me would be how do you accommodate for dissent under the head of defection second how do you ensure that uh, the integrity of the proceedings inspire confidence in the electorate three as a consequence of that or as a corollary of that would be how speedily can you actually address these issues and for which is the forum before which this would necessarily have to go before if it is not the judiciary and if the speaker so far has proved to be let's say that institution has proven to be ineffective as far as expeditious proceedings are concerned what is the alternative that you are looking at i think these are the four issues on which there must be a significant amount of debate and as sir rightly pointed out there is no mention of a political party anywhere you only have the legislature party or a party in the particular house meaning the elected representatives therefore we need to strike the particular distinction and ensure that you don't politicize the constitution when it comes to this and the constitution never ever intended it to be so so i think these are the boundary conditions within which we have to operate absolutely there can be dissent within the party as well and correct. shouldn't be punished for that correct all right uh, yeah. 
Sushil Chandra Tripathi, please close the show for us with your concluding remarks on the best way forward. As I said, I think the immediate requirement is to frame rules which are specific and uh, everyone is bound by them. And the rules before framing, they should be put on the website and uh, I think comments should be invited from all concerned and uh, particularly all legislators and everyone. But the rules must be followed. The arbitrariness in individual cases and the cases all over the country must go away. There should be very specific rules and I, as I said, the primacy of the voter and the representative along balancing along with the defection uh, or his alliance uh, allegiance to the party should be maintained. All right. On that note, then, we'll call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. That's it from me. See you again next time.